This is Duke University. Welcome to the Sanford School of Public Policy and thank you so much for coming to hear the amazing speaker we have with us here tonight. My name is Erin Sweeney and I'm the director of the Connect Politics Project. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Connect Politics and then introduce Mayor Castro so we can get on with his speech and what I hope will be a lively question and answer period. Organized around a speaker series, Connect to Politics, or C2P as we affectionately call it, is an initiative of the Heart Leadership Program, Duke's 26-year-old undergraduate leadership program housed here in the Sanford School. The goal of C2P is to inspire our next generation of political leaders and to build a more robust political culture here at Duke. Throughout the semester, students have had the opportunity to ask young electeds like Mayor Castro questions like, if I decided to run for school board when I graduate from Duke, would people take me seriously? Or, how did you raise enough money to run your first campaign? Or even my personal favorite, how do I tell my parents that I don't want to go to law school and that, in fact, I want to work in politics and make no money? <laughs> I expect our students will have plenty of questions for our incredible speaker tonight. A 39-year-old San Antonio native, Mayor Julian Castro is the youngest mayor of a top 50 American city. Most of you probably know him from his inspiring keynote address at the 2012 Democratic National Convention held not too far away in Charlotte. In that speech, he shared part of his remarkable, uniquely American personal story, part of which I'll share with you now. Julian's mother, Rosie, met his father, Jesse Guzman, while both were working as political activists in the early 1970s. In 1974, they had Julian followed exactly one minute later by his identical twin brother, Joaquin. Bonded in a way that only twins can be, the brothers competed, grew, and thrived under the careful watch of their mother and grandmother. They both received their bachelor's degrees from Stanford University and then went on together to Harvard Law School. Soon after Harvard, Julian jumped into politics. At age 26, he was elected to city council in San Antonio, becoming the youngest councilman in the city's history and claiming the seat his mother had lost 30 years before. He was elected mayor in 2009 at the age of 34 and won re-election last year with more than 80% more than of San Antonio's vote. Throughout his tenure, Mayor Castro has focused on revitalizing the city's urban core, attracting well-paying jobs in the 21st century industries, and positioning San Antonio to be a leader in the new energy economy. Mayor Castro has fought for creative solutions to educational inequality. In fact, under his leadership, the city opened a program called Cafe College, a one-stop center offering high-quality guidance on everything from college admissions to financial aid and standardized test prep to any studi student in the San Antonio area. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to our guest, Mayor Julian Castro. Thank you very much, Erin. Uh, let me thank you for that introduction uh, and uh, for the hospitality that you and everyone here at Sanford has shown. Uh, and it's wonderful to be here at Duke University, a great place. This is my first time here. I think I picked the perfect day with the best weather all year to be here. Uh, I want to thank uh, your dean uh, as well as all of the faculty members that I had an opportunity to visit with uh, just a little while ago. And uh, it gives me a lot of confidence in the educational experience that y'all are having here. Uh, I uh, also, of course, uh, want to thank all of you uh, for having me here. Uh, the last time I was in uh, North Carolina was the Democratic National Convention. and As you can imagine, I'm a little bit less nervous this time. <laughs> so hopefully uh, my comments can be more productive. Uh, let me also say that I think we have some San Antonians in the crowd. Who's from San Antonio? All right. A few. How about from Texas? Anybody from other parts of Texas? There you go. All right. Well, uh, you know, I, uh, I always enjoy being around uh, folks who are committed to the advancement of knowledge. And it always makes me proud uh, to see so many individuals, uh, young folks and folks who are young at heart, uh, who are on the cutting edge of knowledge and of learning and have been successful 
in their own lives. Uh, I remember, uh, I have a story that I love to tell. I remember the day that I found out I passed the bar exam. The day after uh, I found out I passed the bar exam, I went to go have lunch with Erica, whom I was dating at the time, and now she and I are married, and we have a five-year-old little girl. Um, the way you find out whether you pass the bar exam is that, for those of you all who are attorneys, if there's anybody here who's a lawyer or you know someone who is, usually on your state bar's website, they have a whole list of everybody that took it. And if you see your name on the list, you know, you're exuberant. If you don't, you have big problems because you got to take it over. The day after uh, I passed, I went to go have lunch, and I got to the restaurant about five minutes early. Uh, and there was a young woman who was probably 19 or 20 years old, a hostess that was behind a podium like this, one of those restaurant podiums, and I told her that there would be two of us for lunch uh, and that the other person wasn't here, and so I stepped to the side for a second. Uh, uh, Y'all might think that most people in, in politics are loud people, which is not actually true. A lot of us are fairly introverted, but that day I was feeling so good because uh, I had just passed the bar that I blurted out to the young woman, uh, I just passed the bar. And she said, <laughs> she said, oh, you're going to be a bartender? <laughs> so I, it's good to have an education and actually be going places. Uh, and it's great to be with y'all. And the truth is that y'all belong to a generation of young people who have both the privilege and the challenge of coming of age during a time when the world is changing faster than it has at any other time in human history. If you think about how easy it is to communicate with people, how quickly people can travel all over the world, and how inex inexpensively they can do that these days, the fact that the United States and a host of other countries have visited space multiple occasions now, and that medical technology is extending the years of life longer than they ever have. It's a time also when brain power is the new currency of success in the 21st century global economy, and an age when, for the first time ever, nations halfway around the world are producing young people with the intelligence and the ambition to manipulate the new technologies that will define prosperity in the 21st century. And because brain power is so important, you are so important to our national future. In fact, I think more important than young people ever have been. Of course, I have the opportunity to represent San Antonio, Texas. Who's been there? Has anybody been there? All right, folks have probably seen the Riverwalk and the Alamo, and there's no basement to the Alamo, for those of y'all that know what I'm talking about, the Pee Wee Herman movie. Uh, San Antonio now is the seventh largest city in the United States. It's 1.38 million people. It's the second largest city in Texas. Yes, it's bigger than Dallas, city to city, not metro area to metro area. Uh, it is one of the fastest growing communities in the United States. And these days, demographically, it also looks like the Texas and the America of tomorrow. In fact, we like to think about it as the new face of the American dream. And you might wonder, well, why am I listening to a mayor of a city all the way down in Texas? And one of the reasons I would suggest is that we believe that what happens in San Antonio if we can get policy solutions right, it bodes well for cities not just in Texas, but in the United States as they grapple with challenges in the years to come. In fact, folks may remember that old Liza Minnelli tune that was popularized by Frank Sinatra, New York, New York, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. That was true of cities like New York and Chicago and others in the 20th century. In the 21st century, it'll be equally true of communities like San Antonio and like Austin and Dallas and Phoenix and Los Angeles and others that are on the cutting edge of the demographic wave of a diverse America. Of course, 
if you had asked me when I was 18 years old uh, and at college, if I ever thought that I would be standing here in politics, much less delivering a lecture about it, uh, I would have said, no way. Uh, in Charlotte, I had the opportunity to talk about my family's story. I grew up mostly with my mother and my grandmother, and my grandmother, Victoria, had come over from Mexico when she was six years old with her four-year-old sister. They were orphans, and they came through Eagle Pass, Texas, and ended up in San Antonio with extended family. And she ended up dropping out in elementary school, and because of that, she lived her whole life working as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter uh, to make ends meet. She worked uh, as a maid, a cook, and a babysitter and raised my mother as a single parent. My mother was her only child. Uh, my mother was a little bit different from my grandmother because my mother was a hellraiser. She was involved in the old Chicano movement of the late 1960s and early 1970s uh, in a third party at that time called the Raso Nida Party that was neither Democrat nor Republican. Um, and so my brother and I grew up in a household in which democratic participation was encouraged, but the way that that was expressed was that when my brother and I were 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 years old, we were dragged around to rallies and organizational meetings and handing leaflets out on election day at different places. And so if you had asked me when I was 15 or 17 or 18, do you want to go into politics? I would have said no, because I thought of it as boring and ineffective and who likes to be in a three-hour organizational meeting at the public library about who knows what that the adults are talking about. Uh, that changed for me when I went away to college, when I got out to Stanford. My brother Joaquin and I graduated uh, from the public schools of San Antonio in 1992, and we had the opportunity uh, to get out to the Bay Area. And when I got out there, for the first time, I could see my own community from the outside with a different eye. And I could compare the new community I lived in, in the Bay Area, to the community that I had grown up in. And I saw some things that gave me hope, and I saw a lot that gave me pause. I saw in the Bay Area a community that was more well-educated, had higher income levels, was more entrepreneurial, and more ready for the future. On the other hand, I saw in San Antonio a place that was culturally diverse as well, and a place where people of different backgrounds, different perspectives, different religions, had always been able to get along with each other by and large much more so than most big cities in the United States, and a place that still had a sense of community among folks. The kind of place that if two people are pass each other on a downtown street, that they still look each other in the eye. There's still a sense of connection between people. Try doing that in some of the bigger metro areas. I won't name names, but there's a certain guardedness a certain fear of one another, oftentimes that overtakes cities as they become larger and larger. And my interest in politics arose out of two, feel two feelings. The first was I felt very blessed to have the opportunity that I did when so many people that I had gone to school with didn't have the same opportunity. And secondly, I was fascinated by the question of how you could combine the best of those two communities, and to build up a city that was both entrepreneurial and innovative and well-educated, but also a place that still maintained a great fundamental sense of community and connection and character and seemed somehow more manageable than what I felt like in the Bay Area with its cacophony of different things, of voices. And, and that was the beginning of my interest of going into public service. And I know that there are several of y'all who are giving thought to going into public service yourselves. And so I wanted to share with you quickly four moments in my own life that taught me about life 
and about leadership and help me to think about the world the way that I do. They're simple moments, but they've had a lasting impact on the way that I think. The first of those was a moment that happened when I was 11 years old as my brother Joaquin and I got ready to go into middle school. Joaquin and I had grown up uh, up to that time in the public schools of San Antonio, but we'd gone to fifth grade at a Catholic school for the first time ever. Uh, and uh, it didn't go so well. <laughs> I, uh, I used to get headaches at the school every single day because they didn't have windows in the building and my mother had problems affording the tuition, so we got behind. And by the time it came time for our sixth grade year, we decided to go back to public school in the San Antonio Independent School District. And the first thing that we did as part of that process was to go to an orientation for middle school. Y'all will remember, those of y'all who remember middle school, that middle school is actually a big step up, right? You're taking six or seven classes instead of one teacher, and you have your own locker uh, and all of that stuff. And so you need an orientation, I guess, to understand that. And we went to the orientation, and at some point during the orientation, uh, one of the administrators or the counselors made a comment that was almost as in this cliched way that you hear only in the movies, that uh, they asked us to look around the room and, and said that the chances were that, that perhaps half of us wouldn't be there when it was time to graduate from the eighth grade and to move on to high school. And of course, my, I didn't think too much of it as an 11 year old. Uh, I think I was more interested in uh, catching up with my friends from fifth grade uh, but my mother, who went with us that day, after that orientation, she pulled us out of that school and instead enrolled us at a magnet school in the same school district. And I ended up taking three years of Japanese and my brother ended up taking three years of German in this multilingual magnet school. And she told us later that she would never put her sons in a place where they didn't even believe that we could finish eighth grade. The second moment in my life uh, happened a little bit later when I went away to college. Uh, when my brother and I went away to college, we had never seen Stanford before. Uh, you know, we saw the catalog. Some of y'all probably did that for Duke, right? They, they have the glossy pictures and it looks beautiful and the sun's always shining and it's a great opportunity. And, Joaquin and I were trying to decide where we were, we were, where we were going to go to college, and uh, the scholarships and financial aid were a big part of that, and so we decided to go out to Stanford, and my father, I think, bought us the cheapest tickets that you can buy, because we got on Southwest Airlines, and we went to El, El Paso, and then San Diego or LA, and then into San Francisco, and Joaquin and I cried all the way to El Paso. So much so that the, the flight attendant had to bring us those cheap and rough Southwest Airlines napkins to wipe away our tears. It was the first time that we had ever been away from our family. College, in many ways, is a time when you get to redefine yourself. People don't know who you are, and you really don't know who they are. And collectively, you don't know much about the institution that you're about to become a part of. And I remember going to the first party that was had in my vicinity on campus at Stanford. And I remember going to the party because everyone there had these red solo cups that they were drinking from, you know, beer. I think it was just beer, it could have been other stuff. And I remember they had a keg and a, a you know, cascade of cups, and I went and I got a red Solo cup. The thing is that I didn't drink. And at one point in my life, my mother had been drinking too much, uh, and I saw that. And I don't know that I ever made a resolution that I'm never gonna drink, but I shied away from it. I, I just never started. I didn't start drinking in high school. And, uh, she eventually stopped drinking by that time. But at that party, I went and I got one of those red Solo cups. And 
I put water in it and then proceeded to walk around the party all night like I had a beer in my hand and pretend that I was drinking like everybody else. It was the first time that I had ever felt what everybody talks about as peer pressure and the pressure to try and fit in a little bit more with the crowd. It was also the last time that I ever did that. The third moment in my life came a few years later after I graduated from college and before law school. Joaquin and I graduated in 1996 and then we started law school uh, in the fall of 97, but in between I went back to my old high school, Jefferson High School in San Antonio, and uh, I was a permanent substitute teacher because one of the teachers had had a nervous breakdown. Uh, I was 22 years old and I had three classes and each of the classes had more than 35 people in them of 9th, 10th, and 11th graders. And I didn't know anything about teaching. I had never taught a class before. I had done a little bit of subbing uh, before that, but never had the responsibility to actually impart any kind of knowledge on young people. And by the third or fourth day that I was there, I turned around to write something, a lesson on the blackboard. This was before the days, I guess, that you have the board, smart boards that you have now and everything else in the classroom. And so I was still writing on the blackboard. And somebody from the class took this paper ball that must have been like a double paper ball with like two of them wrapped together and threw it and it hit me in the back of the head. And I honestly didn't know whether to turn around and try and figure out who had done it and you know, send him to the vice principal's office or to pretend like it never happened and to save my dignity, uh, which is what I think I tried to do. Uh, I remember feeling every day at four o'clock after the classes like I had to take a nap. So exhausted from trying to teach these young people and manage the classroom and be productive in terms of imparting knowledge effectively. And the fourth moment happened when I was 30 years old. I had been on the city council for four years. I got elected at 26. And at that time, we had very strict term limits in San Antonio. You could only serve two two-year terms. And so I served my two two-year terms, and then I ran for mayor. I was 30 years old, trying to become the youngest elected mayor in the city's history. And I was running against a gentleman who was 70 years old and trying to become the second oldest in the city's history. And uh, he won in a close runoff. Uh, I remember it was about eight minutes past midnight on June 8th of 2005. And for me, it was the first time that I had in my own life really put everything that I had into something and failed at it not succeeded and it felt obviously very miserable you feel like a failure you feel as though there are a million things that you could have done better and should have done better and that feeling of course lasts for a while but eventually it goes away trust me from that first experience with my mother when I was 11 years old, I learned that <clears throat> it is so important in life, no matter what you're doing in your own personal life and in your professional life, to surround yourself with people who love you and who believe in you, oftentimes more than you even believe in yourself. People who can see things for you that sometimes you can't even see. Maybe because you don't have confidence in yourself in one way or another, or you're not dreaming big enough, or just that you need another set of protective eyes on you. I sometimes wonder what would have happened if my brother and I had been there alone that day at that orientation. I never know. Maybe we would have gone to that school and we would have been fine. Or maybe we would have gone to that school and not done as well because the quality of the education wasn't as strong. More broadly, in leadership positions, it's important to surround yourself 
with a team of people who care enough to do what's right for all of you and not just for themselves and who believe in the mission of your team. I think anyone who has been successful would agree that success is hardly ever a purely individual effort. It is the work of other people in conjunction with your work that adds up to success. And finding the right people when you're growing up who care about you to help shepherd you to success and then finding the right people who are colleagues to create success with is one of the most important things I think that anyone who aspires to public service and leadership, whether it's in business or in a nonprofit or medicine or whatever, can do. The second incident in my life taught me that you have to learn to be yourself to have confidence enough to be who you are and not to try and conform to what other people expect you to be. I think y'all are going through a period in college for those of y'all, who's an undergrad? And then who's a grad student? All right, so we have, I think, a few more undergrads here and also grad students going through a period where many of y'all are figuring out what the future holds. I have found that when you are yourself and you are authentic about what you believe and who you are, that it attracts people who care about you, who want to work with you on the basis of something that's authentic. It also gives permission, gives license to other people to be who they are instead of trying to be someone else themselves. And that was the last time that that I ever tried to fake drinking, but it taught me a lot about being comfortable in my own skin and understanding that only if people are comfortable with who you are can you ever really be friends or be part of a team that is meaningfully going to accomplish anything. From the third example, the third experience, I learned that in life there are a lot of things that seem easy to do that actually are not. You see, I had no idea in the world about how to teach, but I thought at the age of 22 that just because I was smart that I could stand in front of a classroom and that I could effectively impart knowledge on these students. Instead, I learned with regard to teaching that it's a craft, that it takes a lot of patience, it takes an understanding of how to manage a classroom effectively, it takes a certain amount of ability to lower your ego uh, and to get past the attitude oftentimes of someone who's 14 or 15 or 16 years old and to figure out a way to to work with them and it taught me that no matter what you do if you want to succeed you have to be prepared I wasn't prepared either in training or in terms of my attitude toward the students themselves and I'm sure that I'm 100% right about that because you know how in life, probably when you're going through school, uh, somebody that you went to school with or, or some project that you did, <laughs> later on people will compliment you about that. Like, you know, sometimes I get compliments from when I was a city councilman. Oh, thank you for fixing that pothole or doing this code compliance issue or now as mayor, we appreciate the work that you're doing. In all of the time since I was in that classroom, not one person has ever said, hey, you did a great job. Thank you for being my teacher back then. <laughs> but it taught me uh, that, if, that if you're going to be successful, do the hard work to prepare yourself and to master the role that you're seeking. When I was in college in my junior or my sophomore, junior year, I remember feeling 
as I started to think about going into public service, this great impatience about the education I was receiving. I thought, if I want to go into politics, why am I not working in some politician's office or in a judge's office or something that's actually showing me how this stuff actually works, how it's actually going to be done? That's part of it. But the other part of it is what y'all are engaging in now, which is the understanding of ideas and the understanding of policy. For those who go into public service, that is invaluable because I have found that the folks who get into problems in public office are people who don't fundamentally know what they believe and don't understand, even if they do, how to get to where they want to go based on what they believe. If you can anchor yourself with strong core beliefs and you've done the hard work to prepare yourself to understand the policy implications of that and you're willing to listen to others, you will be a long way toward achieving success in public service. And from the, from the last experience of losing that election, uh, I learned First of all, that it's true what they say, that you do learn more from losing than from winning. When you lose something like that, it forces you to think about all of the things that you could have or should have done differently. When you win, all of that is sort of glossed over, and, you know, things turned out well, and so you're happy, and you don't think backward, you have a new job, a new role to prepare for, but when you don't, the opportunity you have is to go back and understand how you could have done better. And I think in a very real way that there's a reason why so many of the people who have been the most successful in industries across the spectrum are people who have grandly failed in their lives, in business or in politics or in other walks of life, because it forced them to think about how they could do things differently and do them better. Today, I have the opportunity to lead one of America's most dynamic cities. And I've taken what I've learned in my own experience and tried to apply that to what we're doing in San Antonio. And I'm convinced, basically, that cities are where things still get done in the United States of America. My brother Joaquin, these days, he's in his first term of Congress. He likes to tell people that the difference between us is that I'm a minute uglier than he is. Uh, actually, I'm a minute older than he is. Uh, but these days, uh, I tell him that I have the better job because I can still get something done, uh, <laughs> which is true. And those three things, the three things that I'm convinced cities need to do to be great in this 21st century global economy is first, to create a strong reservoir of brain power and to match that brain power with opportunities in 21st century industries. Secondly, to create in a community uh, a lively, culturally rich, diverse, and vibrant place that has something for everyone and that no one group owns, but is owned by everyone. And then third, to get the fundamentals of good governance right, the basic blocking and tackling, the infrastructure work, things like water and power and governance that people can be proud of instead of a banana republic that you sometimes see in places around the nation and the world. And that's what we're doing in San Antonio. In 2010, we got together over 5,000 residents of the city to start dreaming about our future. Uh, on Saturday, September 25th, 2010, we launched something called SA 2020 with one question. What kind of community do we want to be on Friday, September 25th, 2020, 10 years later? And people came up with a whole range of goals for the city in 11 different issue areas, but basically, the vision was to create a brain power community that is the liveliest city in the United States. And so we focused first on creating that brain power by launching Cafe College, 
which is a one-stop center for admissions and financial aid advice to middle schoolers and high schoolers, no matter if they go to public school or private school or they're homeschooled, and no matter how much their parents make or don't make. And we did that because we found that the ratio of students to counselors in our high schools was, a, was 420 students to one counselor. And in November of 2010, uh, San Antonians did something that they had never done before in the city's history. They decided to raise the sales tax by an eighth of a cent to significantly expand high quality full day pre-K in our city to four-year-olds so that over the next eight years, 22,400 four-year-olds will have an opportunity to get on the right trajectory in terms of their education uh, an opportunity they wouldn't have had before because we found very clearly that the best way to make sure a student gets ahead is to ensure she never gets behind in the first place to get to that person early when you can still set their trajectory. And we're matching that with a new focus in San Antonio on 21st century industries. In my city, the knock on it used to be that it was mostly a place that people wanted to visit. You know, it was a hospitality industry town. Uh, the Riverwalk and the Alamo and SeaWorld, and Fiesta, Texas. It was also a, a military town. At one time, we had five different military installations before two of them closed. But even today, San Antonio has the largest joint base operation in all of the Department of Defense. 77,000 people were there affiliated with the Department of Defense in San Antonio. The challenge that I saw was to build on those industries and to include more 21st century industries in there. By the time I came along as mayor, the largest industry was actually the biosciences and healthcare. Cancer research, primary care that happens there, a medical school that's located there, uh, smaller companies doing interesting work and to supplement that with jobs, for instance, in information security outside of the D.C. area, and specifically Maryland, San Antonio has one of the largest aggregations of information security work. The NSA is down there, although maybe I shouldn't say that these days. Uh, the, the NSA is there, the 24th Air Force, which is basically the cyber command, part of the cyber command for the Air Force. Uh, uh, and so, we're trying to match that brain power with jobs that pay well in new industries. Secondly, we're trying to create in San Antonio a place that is vibrant, that's culturally rich, with a 24-7 downtown. Uh, I hate to say it, but these days there's one cool city in Texas, and y'all probably know which one I'm talking about. They host a little festival every year called South by Southwest. Austin has done a fantastic job with its arts and its culture and its music scene, with the university there and the state capitol. And San Antonio very much uh, is doing what it can to itself excel. And we've launched something called the Decade of Downtown. So there are about 2,500 new housing units going up in downtown. A performing, performing arts center is opening up this September. That river walk that people know is now expanded to 13.1 miles north and south, mostly hiking and biking trails and canoeing and other places for people to enjoy themselves. Uh, we've built linear parks that, stretch, that ring the city of San Antonio now so families can enjoy the outdoors together. Uh, and then finally, we're trying to do that in a city that is safe and is clean uh, and with a governance structure that is well put together. When I served on the city council from 2001 to 2005, we had a series of scandals that hit the council. Don't worry, I didn't have to do, I didn't have anything to do with any of them. But we had two council members that were literally taken out of city hall in handcuffs for bribery. And another one that ran into issues with a campaign fund that he was misusing. And so regaining the public trust over the last decade has been uh, one of, I think, the accomplishments of the mayor before me and then the last few years, I'm proud to say. And if you can create for a city those things, 
brain power that fuels success in this 21st century global economy, the kind of place that people love to live in, work in, visit, and do it in a way uh, that is inviting to everyone and that, it, that is well run, that, those are the ingredients for a successful community in the year 2014 and beyond. I hope that there are many of y'all who will choose to go into public service because the fact is that we don't have enough young people who choose public service these days. We don't have enough folks who decide to throw their hat into the ring, into politics, and offer their talent and their perspective and their ambition and their idealism to improve their local community or their state or the nation. And I can understand why that might be the case. You look at what's happening in Washington, D.C., and no matter what party you're in, you might think, well, what am I going to do that for? You're not going to get anything done. Or it always seems like people are bickering. This is why I hate to turn on the cable news shows sometimes. They make you cringe with the arguments that go back and forth. Also, many people who think about going into politics say they don't go into it because uh, they think that it's just about putting up with insults or people attacking you. And that's true sometimes. In fact, I would argue that today, as a candidate or an office holder, you have to put up with more of that than people have before. Anytime somebody tweets something on Twitter or posts something on your Facebook page, if you don't have the right settings, uh, you look at it. People have unparalleled access these days to contact and communicate with you as an office holder, and that can be for the good or it can be for the bad. Too often times, you hear more of the negative than the positive. However, it's also true that y'all truly have a reservoir of energy and of idealism that is absolutely necessary for us as a nation to regain some of the momentum and the ability to work together that characterized the United States for many years and throughout different generations. And I hope that what you learn here at Duke and the experiences in your own lives, as well as what you learn from others, will help to shape y'all into people that, whether it's through politics or being behind the scenes or in another industry, will help to move your local community forward and our nation as well. Thank you very much. Okay, um, Q&A time. There are microphones, um, one directly in front of me on the first floor, and then one directly above that as well. So I hope this will be a lively Q&A. We'll go for about 30 minutes. Thanks. Mayor Castros, thank you very much for being here. My name is Sue Gilbertson, and I am a community member here in Durham. I've lived here for over 25 years. Um, I work at Durham's Partnership for Children, and one of the things that our staff has done recently is to look at several cities around the country that have universal pre-K programs. And we've studied San Antonio as one of them. Um, Durham does not have universal pre-K, and I would love to see a day when we do have that. I wondered if you would be willing to speak with us a little bit about some of the issues that came up. How did you encourage, teach, uh, or whatever other uh, verbs you would use um, to talk to the community, the business community and community members about the importance of universal pre-K as it affects the community? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. Uh, let me begin with a quick disclaimer. Uh, you know, our, our, our pre-K is not quite universal pre-K. There's still a gap. Uh, however, we hope that the state of Texas will change that at some point, but the money that we were able to raise still will not create universal pre-K. But it is a significant expansion. Uh, 
the way that we did it was to anchor it in support from the business community to convey to folks, let people out in San Antonio know how important pre-K is to ensuring that people get a better education. And the research is very compelling on that. I know that uh, one of the headwinds you face is that folks often equate it with daycare. You know, the way to put it down is that people say, well, it's just daycare. Uh, and it, there's plenty of research to show that that's not the case, that if somebody gets high quality full day pre-K, that it can make a lasting difference in their educational achievement. So I put together something that I called a brain power task force that was a combination of education leaders and business leaders that was chaired by the CEO of USAA, which is the big insurance giant, which is headquartered in San Antonio, and the CEO and chairman of HEB, which is headquartered in San Antonio and is the largest private sector employer in the state. I think they have 77,000 employees. Uh, and these two gentlemen chaired that task force that made the recommendation that we put pre-K for SA on the ballot. So it was absolutely vital that we have the support of the business community so that it, it just wasn't seen as a feel-good thing from the education community. You know, and I say that as my wife has been a teacher now for 12 years and my father was a teacher for 31, but if it's only coming from the teachers and the education community, you know, the people in the middle, I think, are able to write it off more. The way that you get the middle is that you have the business community vouching for it and saying, we need to do this because it's in our economic interest over the long term to do it. And uh, a second component of it is that we made very real the cost of pre-K for SA. So it was a one eighth cent sales tax and, you know, I mean, people have almost been conditioned that when you say a tax increase, they think that, that they're going to have to take out hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars out of their wallet in a year. And, and so it's this big, bad, horrible thing. And so we said, this is, this is $7.81 a year to the median household in San Antonio. Are you willing to pay $7.81 so that these 22,404 year olds can have a great education? Uh, to, to put it in real dollar terms so that it's not, there's no boogeyman of a big tax. Um, and then the, I would say the third thing is uh, to work in what accountability there will be, uh, which is important so that people know how they're going to be able to see the results. And I don't mean high stakes testing for, for people in pre-K, but what I do mean is that, you know, we, we do age appropriate testing that's not in the same model, but, but assessments, you know, on numeracy and literacy and those things. But that you have a report out by a neutral party to the community to demonstrate the results, you know, in an in a impartial way. And so I would tell folks, look, uh, you know, measure this program, and if it's doing a great job, uh, I hope that in eight years you'll consider renewing it. And if the evidence suggests that it's not, then it should never come up on the ballot again. Or if it does, vote against it. You know, people need to know that there's an accountability there. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Marion Johnson. I'm a second year master's in public policy student here. And uh, my question is sort of about your day-to-day -day work. Um, how much would partisanship sort of play in your work with city council, and how much do you think your, pol your own political ideology um, impacts your day-to-day -day decision making and like, what you want to do for the city? Yeah, one of the good things about being at the local level is that we don't run in partisan races. Uh, so yeah, the, in terms of partisanship in our relationship, my relationships with the city council members, it never comes up, come up, comes up. In fact, if you were to take a transcript of all of the different city council meetings, probably over the last 50 years in San Antonio, and probably a lot of cities, I would be surprised if Republican or Democrat came up much. You know, even the word in talking about a policy or a vote, it's just, it's a different culture at the local level. That has very good aspects to it because it allows you to try and you know, work with people without them putting up a wall just because they're from a different party. I remember when I was block walking in 2001, you know, the, the block walking list that we had were people that were both Republican and Democrat. Uh, and people were receptive because I would talk to them about, you know, sidewalks that need to be improved or, 
you know, what I want to do about trying to incentivize jobs. A year later, when I went block walking with my brother, when he was running for state representative, first of all, most of the block walking lists were of Democrats. Uh, and then when we did go to the occasional person that was a Republican, and I'm sure this works both ways, but you could tell, I mean, right away, if, you know, if people ask you, oh, are you Republican or Democrat? And if you're Democrat, you know, just not. There's a wall that goes up. We have the luxury of working across the aisle. And uh, I think that at the national level, if they could find ways within the governance structure to mirror that more, that they would be more productive than they are now. Uh, for instance, this is a crazy idea, but, uh, and will never be done, but I would be interested to see what would happen, for instance, if you took one week at a state legislature or in D.C., and you didn't report the vote, and you had you know, a week where you're gonna have some pretty hot votes that might be you know, close, and you didn't record, you didn't report the representative's vote on that until, let's say, three months later or six months later, until the heat of the moment is gone and they could cast a secret ballot in the legislature or in Congress. Now, people would still have that, how they voted on something when they run, and so they might get beat up about it in the primary, and that's still the problem. But I do believe that in the nonpartisan system, people are willing to cross the aisle a lot more, and that's a good thing. Good evening, Mayor. My name is Diego Quezada. I'm a student here at Duke. And one thing that you mentioned was that students should really have that ethical fiber, the moral values that really guide you. So I was really wondering, what are your moral values that, really, that, that you really hold, hold dear, and how do those values translate to your policies and your world's view? Thank you. Um, I think different things in my life. You know, I remember having a conversation um, with my mother. I think we were driving to the mall when I must have been about 16 years old. Um, and, and, and I asked her, you know, for whatever reason, I said, oh, you know, if I ever went into, went into politics, you know, what's your advice? And she said, to be honest. And I think more than anything else, that that's what all of us strive to do, is to have integrity, to be honest. Um, and I, I see that as number one. Uh, secondly, I think all of us are inspired by our faith. Uh, I grew up Catholic. Uh, probably not the best Catholic, though. I didn't go to church every Sunday. Still don't. Uh, but with the idea that one of the, the values uh, and what attracted me to the Catholic faith was the idea of serving others. You know, a lot of the Catholic faith and other faiths are about serving other people, not just serving yourself. And, and I take that to heart as well. And there are days when I feel like I'm meeting that, and there are days when I feel like I'm not, you know, like I'm failing at that. Um, so I think those are a couple of the things of having integrity and trying to, trying to make sure that you're always serving other people. Hi, my name is Jordan Skimmerhorn, and I'm one of the San Antonians here, so I'm especially glad to see you visiting Duke. Um, and when I came here for grad school, it um, struck me that when most people talk about how Texas cities are changing and how more often how the Texas electorate is changing, it's in terms of demographic issues. But there's also this huge migration pool. People are moving to San Antonio and other cities in Texas and not leaving. Um, so I'm interested in how you think uh, that's affected the city over the years um, since you've been in office. <clears throat> A couple of ways, yeah. I mean, you're very, you're very right that one of the stories that is under-analyzed and under-reported and probably under-researched at the academic level, although I, you know, I, haven't, I haven't done the research to see how much research has been done on it, so I don't know for sure, and I'm sure the academics here do know, but uh, what's changing Texas is not just the demographic changes that everybody hears about and writes about and so forth of the Hispanic community growing. It's that is that you're having an influx of people move in from other states, uh, and politically those folks are generally more moderate than the people that are there in Texas on average. And so you're having the effect over time probably that you saw in North Carolina or that you see in Northern Virginia's influence over the rest of Virginia. Um, it's just that Texas is so much bigger that it's gonna take longer for, for that to be felt getting away from the politics for a second and talking about just the quality of life, what I've noticed is that 
people coming from places in California, you know, Florida, Nevada, wherever, is that they expect certain amenities in the city that oftentimes these, these Texas cities have not been great about. For instance, um, uh, you know, park space or um, rail transportation. You know, Austin, Houston, Dallas have light rail now. San Antonio is the last big city that does not. We have this streetcar project that is in the works, and that's you know drawn a lot of opposition from the Tea Party and so forth. Um, but we're, I can clearly see that we have people coming into the community that expect a higher level of amenities than than usually most of these fairly straightforward communities in Texas have offered. Austin is probably the best example of that. Um, so those are a couple of the things. Hi, um, I'm Charlie Malthrop. I'm a senior. Um, and I'm actually applying to be a data manager at SA2020 um, through Venture for America. Oh, um, so I'm pretty yeah. familiar with it. It's a yeah. pretty awesome platform. I've poked around. Um, and my question actually is not, could you give me a job? But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, actually, if you could, that'd be awesome. Yeah. But, um, Thank you. Um, Poking around, it also uh, follows up on a demographic question. Um, you know, we talk about building San Antonio's community with the people it has, but also trying to mirror the growth um, that uh, something like the Bay Area has seen. Um, what is in your uh, city government's power to ensure that what you're, you know, the improvements that you're tracking and seeing in San Antonio are not the result of you know, a demographic turnover where, you know, low-income families are finding themselves excluded and high-income families are coming in. So how do you ensure that, you know, before you raise the victory flags on all, all these metrics, that, that the city has made sure that, that we're helping the right people? Yeah. yeah, no, thank you very much for the question. And, you know, I still have not found a single example of a city that has handled the issue of gentrification well. I don't think anybody has figured out that policy. The good news for San Antonio is that we haven't seen that really yet. I mean, a little bit of it, but, but we're almost, you know, at the beginning, basically, and we're starting to see it. We still have time to try and implement policies to, to stave it off and to make sure that, that both, both groups get to participate, people who are new, but also families that have been living in areas for a while. So in the terms of the mechanics, what are, the what are the types of things that you start thinking about in terms of addressing that? Well, you start thinking about well, what is the process by which people basically get nudged out of a neighborhood. Uh, it's different things. In the classic telling of it, it's that their property taxes, for instance, become so high that, that they just can't afford it um, anymore. So there are some cities that have started to look at freezing people's property taxes or giving them a discount on that. That's something that we're beginning to think about. Uh, another, another issue is um, sometimes people just cash out. You know, the values of, of an area are going up so much that even if they could afford it, well, they're, they're gonna, they wanna sell their home, especially if, if they're not a senior citizen and they've been living there forever. Maybe they're middle-aged and their kids are almost out of high school or something. Um, at base, the question is, how do you keep the authenticity of a neighborhood and still accept some level of change in it and make it dynamic? And the honest answer is that I don't have a great answer for it, and I can't find anybody that actually does. You know, the promising part is that I know that that issue is extremely hot right now. You may have seen that Spike Lee wrote uh, in the New York, New York Times, A.O. Scott, the film critic, wrote something uh, that Spike Lee didn't like about gentrification and he wrote a retort back on the issue of gentrification in part of New York. Um, that's not a policy discussion necessarily, but there are a lot of policy discussions and more cities around San Antonio like Austin that we can look at to try and learn from it. And uh, I have a lot of learning to do on it, but when I do, uh, we, we definitely will act on it. Thanks a lot. Lucy Stokes and I live in Durham. So I'm, uh, I liked hearing your concrete ideas on the task force for the pre-K. So what are the concrete things you're doing about uh, job attraction versus education matching for the 21st century? Yeah. One more. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
I'd be interested to hear, since we're at Duke and we're part of the community with the university and the community, what, how is the community versus the upper higher education work in your town? Great, thank you very much for the question. Um, so the, the, one of the things that we're taking on now is this issue that many communities face of, of <clears throat> closing the workforce skills gap that exists. We, we hear from employers like Toyota. Toyota has a, a huge assembly or manufacturing plant down there. They do the Tacoma and the Tundra there and they have 21 on-site suppliers as well. It's the only plant in North America that actually has all of its first-tier suppliers there. So they have about 57 or 50, 100 employees on one site. Um, Boeing does uh, aircraft maintenance and finish out there. Lockheed Martin, Rackspace uh, is located there. We hear from them that, that they have trouble finding uh, well-skilled employees for some of their jobs. And then on top of that, it's not just the hard skills, but it's the soft skills of people showing up on time, knowing the etiquette of the workplace. Uh, and so what we've done is that we actually now have established the talent pipeline task force of people in the business community and education community to come up with uh, solutions over the next couple of months that we can implement to better churn out talent for those employers that need these employees. So what are we doing in the high schools? What are we doing in the community colleges? And what are we doing in the universities with how many people they're tur turning out in a certain major, how many people with a certain associate's degree? And then in high schools, we have something called the academies. And they're basically uh, this model where uh, you, you're in an apprenticeship, your 11th and 12th grade year. So for instance, at Boeing, um, they'll take I don't know, three dozen students every year, and they're still going to school, but half their day is spent at Boeing learning the job. Uh, and when they get out, they have community college credit, they graduate from high school, and Boeing will hire them uh, if, if they want to go to work immediately. So they have choices, and Boeing has you know, employees uh, that they need. Um, that's sort of what we're doing now, and, and some of the answers are still ahead, but it's something that we're very focused on. Uh, the other part that you mentioned was this relationship between the university and, and the community, and there has been a lot that's been written about the ivory tower, and not necessarily in terms of Duke itself, although I'm sure Duke, like any other university, has, has had its challenges. I remember that was an issue for Stanford. Palo Alto and East Palo Alto especially was a community that you know, needs a lot of, needed a lot of help. Um, I have this great book in my office at City Hall called University as Urban Developer about different examples of universities that have actually integrated themselves into the community. So what we've done is that we've, we've, we've supported universities that, that improve themselves and then also work with us to improve neighborhoods in the area. A good example of that is this university called Our Lady of the Lake University, a small Catholic university in San Antonio on the west side of the city, one of the more impoverished areas. Uh, we're improving a park and lake right across the street from there, uh, and then they're improving some of the streetscaping and the entrance to the university, uh, and they've done a good job of opening the university up more to the community to go to the events that happen there uh, whether they're at the library or one of the lecturers, to, to try and integrate the community more into the life of the university. Uh, in terms of research, you know, away from, from land use, uh, we have the largest uh, municipally owned utility in the United States that services both electric and gas customers. And about three years ago, we got them to agree to invest $50 million in the University of Texas at San Antonio to stand up a sustainable energy research institute to you know, get accomplished in renewable energy research. But that's basically money from the ratepayers of San Antonio that is directly uh, propping up the University of Texas at San Antonio. It's a unique partnership. But uh, I believe that the city of San Antonio, the structure, the governance, governance organization is a servant of the universities. 
And so in every economic development deal that we've done, we usually have them include some money for the universities and the community colleges so that you can train more people, educate more folks, and create more opportunity. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm in a sophomore undergraduate public policy major here. Um, and I have another question about education. Um, many uh, large metropol metropolitan cities, especially those with high percentages of ESL students, have seen significant increases in the number of charter schools. And several mayors, uh, Cory Booker, uh, Bill de Blasio, have come out and taken very strong stances either for and against them. Uh, what do you believe um, is the role of charter schools in uh, San Antonio going forward? Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, of course, that's been the, the subject of a, a lot of back and forth. Uh, I guess I don't see myself in any one camp. Um, you know, I attended public schools my whole life. My wife teaches in the public schools. My dad did. Uh, and the fact is that the public schools still have more than 90% of the students in San Antonio. And so uh, our, our primary focus is always going to be on what can we do to improve the public schools. At the same time, I support excellence in education where I find it. And so I've been supportive of uh, charter schools like KIPP and uh, now IDEA is down in San Antonio and I think Rocket Ship and a couple of others. Um, that have demonstrated high quality as much as possible. You know, you want them to be neighborhood schools and so forth and avoid some of the challenges that public school advocates sometimes launch at them. But, you know, I, I can't support the idea of saying no altogether to charters because I think that, that there are charter schools that are doing a great job. And the challenge is how do you find the right balance uh, and hopefully get them to work together well uh, my daughter just got a letter two weeks ago uh, from the San Antonio Independent School District and one of their in-district charters, so it's a public school district charter called Bonham Elementary. She's going to go there uh, for school. Hi, my name is Sonia Shaker. I'm a second year on PP, so I'm at Duke, and I'm looking for a job. And just being looking for public service jobs, um, I automatically am biased towards places that are more open to change. And um, you know, when I think of states like Texas, I think you know my services would be like very undervalued there. I'm also focusing on health policy, so that's like extra acute right now. So I just want—I was curious to hear your pitch to you know MPPs, undergrad public policy majors of going to states where, you know, if you read the newspaper every day, there isn't a huge appetite for change or public policy in general. Well, I guess my pitch would be that you can be a part of creating it, right? Uh, of creating that change. And uh, just a few years ago, there were a lot of people that looked at North Carolina and thought, come on, you know, that's never going to, they had a certain image of North Carolina and look, I mean, I think you would find here you have a diversity of opinion and thought and and uh, a state that is now just diverse in and of itself. The same thing with a lot of these uh, states like Texas. You, you do have strong um, communities of, of interest and, and people who you know, are, are very open to new ideas and, and to change. And so I know that Texas in some ways has had a, a reputation of not necessarily being open to change, but that, that's changing in and of itself uh, because it, it really, the state is changing so much that, that that's not going to hold for much longer. Um, and the truth is that Texas was never, um, I think, as anti-intellectual uh, as some folks, you know, probably projected it out to be because of their actions. Uh, the, the, the place has always been a hotbed of, of uh, people with new ideas and new thoughts. It was a frontier community, you know. That basically, like several states in the United States, that was that was a frontier. It was for people who were adventurous uh, and were trying to make a new life and you know, settle down. So there's still very much an element of that. Hi, my name is Laura Mortimer. I'm also a second year uh, MPP student here. And my question is kind of similar to Sonia's. Um, I'm very interested in how change happens um, and when and where and why. 
And um, so, and one thing that I think about a lot, I grew up in Mississippi in a very religious family and a very religious state. And, um, and it doesn't seem like uh, many politicians, especially at the state and federal levels, are, um, are atheist or agnostic or just not religiously affiliated. Everyone seems to have some affiliation by that point. And so I'm wondering, you talked a lot about authenticity earlier. Um, for, uh, for politicians or for folks who may be interested in uh, public leadership in any, at any level um, who may not be religiously affiliated or, God forbid, who may be atheist, um, do you think that there's a place for that at this point? And can you talk a little bit about how sure. the landscape is changing there? I do. I, I think that there's a place for that um, because people, fund, people are so cynical about politics and politicians that the number one thing they're looking for is authenticity. And so if someone who is atheist or an agnostic is upfront with folks about what they believe and why they believe it, uh, you know, I think over time that most people can accept that. Now, does that over time mean that before the November election they're going to get over it? I don't know. Uh, there's no question that that, that that, you know, that in the United States that generally doesn't help. Uh, that's probably true. But more than anything else, if you're leveling with people about what you believe and why you believe it, I think that there's a cer certain amount of respect that people have for that. And uh, I served with a colleague when I was on the city council. And she was Catholic. However, she would not say the Pledge of Allegiance. She would never pledge to the flag because she believed that, uh, you know, the only loyalty that she had was, was uh, you know, to God and not, she wasn't, just wasn't going to say the pledge. And she was very liberal, too. Um, but in the beginning, some people made a big deal out of that. But after a while, you know, people accepted that because they believed that she was doing it out of, a, out of a genuine belief, and not out of a malevolent belief or not trying to pull one over on somebody. I mean, just, that's just what she believed. I think also that if you, you look at what has happened on the issue of marriage equality over the last you know, 10 or 12 years, it was just 10 years ago in Texas in, in 04, 05, in that time frame that, that they instituted their constitutional amendment uh, you know, prohibiting gay marriage uh, and a whole bunch of other states as well. And look how quickly things have turned around on that issue. I mean, 10 years ago, it was unthinkable that, that we would be here with, you know, 16 or 17 states saying that, yes, it's okay to have marriage equality, which is a great thing. So things can change sometimes in fairly short order. And people can, can open up their mind in fairly short order. All right, maybe one last question, all right. This could maybe be a good question to end on, actually. Um, so I'm taking a class on state and local politics. Um, I'm also a second year MPP. And we, tomorrow in class, have a debate about um, which is better, Texas or Colorado. Um, and I am on the side of Texas. <laughs> Texas, all right, um, there you go. Yes, yeah. and, and it's sort of supposed to talk about, I guess, what these states are doing or how they're changing. Um, that gives them sort of particularly bright futures. And so I'm wondering what you could do to help me with yeah, my faith. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that'd, that'd probably take and, another hour for me to yeah. state. You want me to state your case for you? <laughs> I'm well, just kidding. Well, I mean, I, I'll take notes and quote <laughs> you in class. But, well, but sort I mean, of what is your pitch for why Texas has a great future? Yeah. Well, first of all, I think that those two states actually are, are a lot more similar than it first meets the eye because they're, they're both states that are uh, very diverse, states that are both growing, unlike a lot of other states in the country, um, states that have this mix of, of urban, suburban, and rural that is interesting. Where they differ is um, probably on how conservative or progressive they've been on certain issues. Um, so, uh, you know, I think what's the strength of Texas is that it has one side of the equation down very, very well, which is 
to be a place where people want to go and do business. The side of the equation that it's not as good at is that you have to create the brain power and the human capital to meet that more and more for jobs that require uh, high skills. And that as time goes on and the competition gets stiffer for those, those types of investments, I think Texas risks falling more and more if they don't produce that. Whereas my sense is that Colorado probably has been more willing to do that. City to city, for instance, Denver passed a pre-K program a number of years ago, you know, recognizing the importance of early childhood education. Um, probably also on these lifestyle issues, Colorado has been uh, somewhat different. I'm thinking of the marijuana uh, law. Uh, you know, I honest, I don't, I haven't come to a firm conclusion of, of whether Texas should go in that direction or not, but I will say that I, I, it's my sense that that may give Colorado a competitive economic advantage uh, over other places in the future um, because it attracts a creative class of people. It attracts a whole bunch of people, <laughs> but among the whole bunch of people that it attracts is that it attracts a creative class of people and probably makes it more attractive for all sorts of industries, the gaming industry, the arts uh, and culture industry, hospitality industry, for sure, people who want to visit. Um, I think where Texas's strength is, is that it, it has become, it has set a pretty good business climate, and it has institutions like the University of Texas and NASA and others that are churning out knowledge and research at a very high level, and that, that has a ripple effect on the state. Uh, so Texas is going to win, don't worry. Uh, I have to say that. But, but I do believe that, that Texas can be uh, the most successful state in the United States, not just with jobs now, but 20 years from now. You know, I tell people over there just briefly that uh, Rick Perry said something that I agreed with the last time that he was, uh, he was inaugurated. He said that, that throughout American history that first we had looked to the East Coast for leadership and prosperity, and then we looked to the West Coast for leadership and prosperity, and that more and more people were going to look in this 21st century to the Gulf Coast, to Texas. And I believe that that can be true, uh, but only if we get two parts of this thing right, which is this business climate, but also the investment in people and in opportunity, and match those together. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for having me.